This is a story about a janitor who left behind a big amount of money when he died. How big an amount? Eight million dollars. You heard it right, eight million dollars. The story goes like this. This janitor turned multimillionaire is named Ronald Reed. Ronald Reed was born in 1921 and after World War II, he actually returned to Vermont and continued his work as a gas station attendant and mechanic for 25 years. Thereafter, he took a part-time job at J.C. Penney, sweeping floors and that is where he slogged for 17 more years until 1997. That is actually where his janitor title comes about. But there's a gap in this timeline. If we see the narration in Wikipedia, he actually retired after his mechanic work of 25 years. That is in 1970 at the age of 49. Maybe he became bored or maybe he was just worried that he would run out of money. But whatever the case is, this is a classic example of barista fire. Or to be specific, janitor fire. As to why he chose to be a janitor is not really mentioned because it's definitely not the most glamorous job in the world. But it also sensationalizes the title. It kind of overshadows his previous work of 25 years as a guest attendant and mechanic whereby our guess that pay is actually not too bad. So let's pull in some numbers and work backwards to see what was his situation back at the age of 49. If his net worth now is $8 million, and assuming he has been growing his investments at an 8% per annum compound rate, back in 1970, his investment pot would only be $158,000. That seems a small amount, correct? But take note again, that is 1970 and the median annual income back then was only $9,870 per year. That means his investment pot of $158,000 is actually 16 times the median annual income back in America in 1970. So let's compare as to current situation versus what he faced, and we'll realize that today's median income is around $60,000 plus. If you were to use 16 times current median income, we would realize that he actually retired with today's equivalent of about $960,000. That is close to a million dollars, a decent amount for FIRE, correct? Financial independence, retire early. And straight away, we can put a few key points. First, you do need decent income. If he had been working as a janitor all along, maybe he wouldn't have any savings and maybe he wouldn't be able to grow his investment pot at all. So it's important to find decent income and it goes to suggest a guest attendant or mechanic is definitely decent income enough to save up for retirement. So retirement is not only belonging to those who are high income, huh? this is proof again that median income is sufficient if you are frugal. Then the second part also is financial independence retiree FIRE was already existing back in 1970 because he retired at age of 49 with close to today's equivalent of $1 million. And the humbling part is he even took up a janitor role even as a millionaire. So it goes to show when you are financially independent already, you can choose to do whatever job you like. Maybe you really just want a no stress work and that's totally your choice. So again, work towards your own financial independence. Next, he bought a two bedroom house for $12,000 when he was 38. That's good. Settle your family down. Then he died in 2014 at the ripe old age of 92. In his will, he actually left behind $2 million to his stepchildren and $6 million to his local library and hospital. Let me pause over here. Have you done your own will? If you are also a young parent, that's something I'll definitely suggest. I've done my own will. I've gotten my wife to take that effort to go and pen down something because I think it's very important, especially if you're in the stage of being a young parent also. Do note, a will is not just how you distribute your wealth. There are also important things such as who to appoint as guardian because you don't want friction with all the grandparents and aunties, uncles. You want to appoint a guardian and give specific enough instructions so that there is no confusion and friction. Many young parents feel it's unnecessary, but that's where I would like to advocate again to take that time to get your will done. Because there are stories also that both parents passed away together due to an accident and there's a big mess left behind. Then the second part is he left $2 million to his stepchildren and donated $6 million. I think the point over here is not to leave too much behind for children. I also believe in that because the most important thing that we want to leave behind is to teach the next generation how to fish, correct? If you leave behind a big bucket of fish, you may actually starve them because they don't know how to fend for themselves, they don't know how to earn for themselves. So living enough so that they have the resources to do what they want, but also not too much such that it becomes spoiled. And with that, I'd like to bring on a story that I've actually read before on Chuck Feeney. He was once a billionaire. He actually founded Duty Free Shoppers, DFS, and his objective as a billionaire was to die broke. 
You heard it correct, die broke. His story inspired Warren Buffett to be in philanthropy. And it goes to show, you need not leave only monies behind when you're dead. You can actually actively donate while you're still alive. If you agree with that message, help me smash the like button and show some love to the world and be active in donations. Let's read on further on what we can learn from Ronald Reed. The first lesson is he actually led a frugal lifestyle. And being frugal means that you live below your means. Before his death, he drove a used 2007 Toyota Yaris. His lawyer actually recalled that despite his millionaire status, he would park his car at parking lots that didn't have meters, which meant he had to walk a long distance to get to where he needed to just to save some parking dollars. He also enjoyed inexpensive breakfast at his local coffee shops. Now coming to this point, I used to park far where I have free parking, but nowadays I park at the mall simply because at this stage in life, time is very, very precious for me. I don't mind paying that parking to save on that time, but hey, when I get old, I might actually value back the exercise and saving on that money. So different stage in life, we do different things. Then the second part of inexpensive breakfast. I think that is in the concept of skipping the morning Starbucks for financial freedom. Because when you choose a simpler alternative other than Starbucks drink, which costs $6-$7, there is an opportunity cost whereby you can actually save up that money buying a simpler coffee option. And once this saved up money is compounded over time, it becomes a big sum of money. So even a millionaire like him is also practicing frugalness and choosing simpler alternatives. Subsequent parts of the story suggested that Mr. Ronald Reed actually continue to wear old clothes. I think that is being too frugal, that's being too stingy. Maybe old people don't like to change things, so that is probably in that direction. But if we were on a key learning point, living below your means, which also means someone who earns high income of $20,000 a month, but spends $20,001, will still live paycheck to paycheck. This reminds me of a previous article I read. Junior bankers wasting their income. In that article in Financial, it's mentioned that junior bankers were regularly updating their smartphones and buying designer shoes to look the part. Sometimes maybe it's work environment, but it's a classic case of groups that are high income, but many of them are definitely not saving much. I guess they may not be in debt, but many of them are under saving relative to their income. Maybe they are only saving $1,000 because of their lifestyle inflation. That's something to take note because again, it's how much you save that helps you get to financial independence, retire early. Lesson number two, invest your money only in things that you know. Mr. Ronald Reed only bought companies that he understood, similar to what Warren Buffett has said about circle of competence. He avoided technology stocks as he didn't understand them. That's also why I cover a lot of Singapore stocks over here. I do not have a lot of high-flying US stocks in cloud computing, in green energy, because these are spaces that I can't understand also. I guess many of you also don't work in these industries and what we can pick is only analyst report, which could be biased. We don't have really ground knowledge. And later part of the story, we'll actually be seeing what does Mr. Ronald Reed invest in. It's okay to miss out opportunities if we don't understand these investments. There are many other ways to grow your money safely. And speaking of missed opportunities, I guess the biggest FOMO fear of missing out right now is quite obviously property, correct? Residential property. I sold out my HDB flat. I'm leaving a circle. But I see news articles of condos with people queuing up and it looks like a mass hysteria with no fear that this could be a property peak. And right now also there's a new topic on co-living that seems to be the new opportunity to make money. And I'm in the midst of doing a deep dive into that topic. If you're keen, smash the subscribe. I'll be releasing something to explain a bit on co-living investment just in case you always had that questions seeing some advertisements come up on your YouTube feed. Let's go back to learn from Mr. Ronald Reed. And this is actually his top 10 holdings upon his death. First one and biggest allocation, Wells Fargo, one of the big banks in US. Second, Procter & Gamble, I'm sure you know P&G. Third, Colgate and Palmolive, I guess you also used before Colgate. Fourth, American Express, we all know who they are. And fifth, JM Smucker. Do you know JM Smucker? How could you not know JM Smucker? According to what I checked, it's a 16 billion company. And how could I have not known about it? It right now owns some famous brands, which I've never seen before, other than one, Dunkin' Donuts. Wow, I learned something today also. It goes to show that we don't need to know every stock in the world. But being an investor, you need to pick things that you are comfortable with. Right here in Singapore, I really don't know James Marker. But if you're in US, you definitely are familiar with some of his brands. In Singapore, I'm familiar with Samsung, but I guess everyone else in the world 
doesn't really know their value proposition and their market share in supermarkets right here. At the point of his death, he owned 95 stocks. To me, that is too broad. But again, Mr. Ronnery comes from a phase whereby there is no funds, no ETFs that helps anyone diversify. And that's why he had to do diversification himself. Lesson number three, being patient with your investments. Mr. Ronnery has held some of his investments for a very long time. Same as what Warren Buffett has preached frequently. And I would like to draw special attention to this. On the contrary, jumping in and out of stocks based on trending news will do no good for our portfolio. As American economist Paul Samuelson once said, investing should be watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. This part I like to expand because you know a lot of times I see people on forums share that, oh, I bought this stock at $1, $1.10, cent, I sell it, I cash it on 10% profits, and then I go and buy something else. Maybe you've done so also. Huh? Then this something else kind of stagnated, a bit boring, didn't move that much. Thought it was going to the moon, but didn't move. Then suddenly this stock, which I first abandoned, shot up to 130. Ha! Huh, I have to quickly sell back that investment is not moving and get back onto this freight chain. Maybe it's Palantir, because right now Palantir is a limelight. And then after buying this, this stock comes back down to $1.20. So the first question is, isn't it better to stay put? That could be a 20% gain already. And the key part is this. If you frequently do a lot of churning of small wins, small losses, it actually gets you nowhere. Investments gain is not about trading for small, small profits and accumulating that. That doesn't work because there's definitely going to be losses. Investments is about multi-baggers. Investments is about collecting dividends and compounding it. Note that key difference, avoid over-trading also. And this is a key point to definitely, definitely note down. Lesson number four, be a learning machine. Mr. Ronnery was an avid learner. Some documentaries that I've watched on Mr. Ronnery has suggested that his house was filled with annual reports. He really loved keeping tabs with his investments and it reinforces. If you want to do stock investments, you must really be competent and happy to read annual reports. If not, you are probably better off being diversified. It also shows that knowledge compounds just like investments. Lesson number five, mistakes are unavoidable. His portfolio included shares like Lehman Brothers, which went bankrupt, but that didn't affect his portfolio too much. On high side now, it's quite obvious that Lehman Brothers is a bad investment. But take note again, before 2008, Lehman Brothers was a blue chip, well-trusted brand in the finance space. Anyone who done a YOLO and put all their investments and retirement into Lehman Brothers would have went bust, but not Mr. Ronald Reed. Today, the most logical stock to buy could be Tesla or Palantir or DBS. Techno again, we don't know what will happen in 20, 30 years time. Even great companies can make mistakes and go bankrupt. So never put all your retirement eggs in one basket. If you are serious about preserving wealth for your entire retirement and leaving something behind for the next generation. To me, Silly has done a fantastic write-up on this. I'll leave links below just in case you want to follow on it. And I'd like to round out our discussions with the three key points, which is firstly, the importance of being frugal so that you have surplus to invest for the long term. Second, to be patient and be boring in terms of your investments and let things compound. The third is investment mistakes are unavoidable, so never YOLO and go all in in any particular stock. And maybe we should also expand this topic to not be afraid of investing. Someone who has made mistakes but being in the market has still grown his portfolio to very significant amounts and is still way better than putting all your monies into fixed deposits. Let me know as always which pointers resonate the most with you. Leave them in the comment sections. And if that since you start with me here, let me suggest a previous tutorial I've done of a couple who actually became financially independent at the age of 31. If you haven't seen that story, follow on with this link and I'll also see you there. Maybe you'll inspire a bit further and also remember to smash a like when you reach there. Take care as always. Goodbye.